Well, this could put a damper on our day. Have to figure this one out. Okay, well, at least it's nothing serious. It's the uh, evaporative uh, emission control system, and this happens when on these on this style vehicle, these GMCs and these Chevys. When you go down a lot of dirt roads, it plugs up the uh, filter down there, so it can't sense, uh, you know, your the uh, vapors from the gas tank. It's nothing serious. I'll have to fix it when I get home. I've done this a dozen times on this car already because we go down a lot of dirt roads. But anyways, that's what it is. I wanted to show you how I determine what it is. I bought one of these for $15 off of uh, Amazon, and it's just a diagnostic interface, and it, it plugs into your OBD port underneath your dash. Mine's just down here underneath the dash. Just plugs right in, and then you... Uh, I've got this app called Torque Pro. And it interfaces with that uh, reader that uh, plugs in underneath the dash. And it's got fault codes on it and everything. You can read your fault codes. You can erase your fault codes. Gives you all kinds of inf engine information. All for a total of about 20 bucks for the app and for the uh, diagnostic interface that I got off of Amazon. Really easy. And when you get that service engine soon light, you can at least figure out what's going on. Sometimes on that service engine soon, it just gives you a code number. And when it does that, you uh, Google that number and it'll tell you what, what the uh, code means. It's very handy. Well, today makes 45 years. This is our 45th wedding anniversary this morning. Happy anniversary, Linda. <laughs> Happy anniversary. You know, last night in the middle of the night, in a dream, I wrote a beautiful love song for Linda. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, sure. oh. <laughs> sure, Rick, sure. <laughs> I did, honest. And I thought, oh, this is going to be so cool. I got to sing it to her in the morning. Not that I can sing, but <laughs> I woke up this morning and couldn't remember one note. <laughs> I forgot it all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It has been 45 years, so... Well, trust me, baby, you were in my dreams last night. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we're heading home, or we're starting our, we're starting our trip back home. I hate this time of our, of our trips. <laughs> you know, I, I've discovered that there is no working your way home. Oh, we'll do this, we'll do this route, and, and then we'll work our way back home. It doesn't work that way for me. When we start to think about returning home, I kind of lose all my uh, excitement for the trip and I just want to book it home at that point. So what we did on this trip, and it worked out better for us, is we stayed gone and we, until, we de until we finally decided we're going home. And then at this point, now we're just going to book it for home. Actually, my youngest granddaughter, who's just a little over one, she mistook another man for her papa. That's what did it. <laughs> so at that point, it was like, oh no, we're going home. <laughs> you know, we never know where we're going to spend the night. Very seldom, maybe not even 10% of the time do we know where we're going to stay. And my friends at home asked me, they say, how the heck do you do that? Well, it doesn't always work out good. Sometimes it doesn't work out very good at all, but I'd say... 80% of the time it works out very nice. Uh, once in a while we get caught out and we end up staying in a Walmart parking lot or a Cabela's or something. Uh, Cabela's has been very kind about that, by the way. I don't know if it'll last, but they've been very good. But most of the time we just, uh, we, look at, for, we look for National Forest and we especially look for BLM. And then anytime you see a road into National Forest or BLM, uh, take it and drive back in and see what you find. That's why we like our, our outfit that, that we travel with now. That, the, the car and the trailer like that, I can turn that around on a dime. So we get down some of these roads and they dead end and I can always get turned around and headed back out again. But that's how we end up finding these nice places all the time. We generally travel until, I like to stop, so does Linda. We like to stop earlier, like three in the afternoon. Give us time to set up camp and enjoy it. 
you know, maybe have a beer or something and plan what we're going to have for dinner that night. Um, very seldom do we travel past five. You know, five would be, you know, it starts getting a little risky. Then all of a sudden you're looking at evening and you haven't got a place to stop yet. One night, middle of winter, eastern Washington, and we were headed for Seattle. We had some business there and we were pulling our little trailer over. And <laughs> the, uh, we stopped at a truck stop in Moses Lake and we went clear to the back, you know, of the lot. We asked first and they said, oh, go park in the back. So we went and parked in the back and pretty soon one refrigerator unit pulled up right next to us and then another one pulled up on the other side and our walls were vibrating that <laughs> we, had, we had to leave. It was like maybe 10 o'clock at night or something like that and we had to leave. Those poor truckers, they needed the rest worse than us. <laughs> One particularly nice little treat we discovered was in the Midwest, traveling through the little towns, Iowa, Minnesota, places, the um, city parks, a lot of them allow overnight camping still. Right in the middle of town, they'll have a nice city park. And I think it's a, <clears throat> I think it's a carryover from the old days, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, when people traveling by car was kind of a, a new thing and <clears throat> but they still carry on you can still find it and that that's always been a really nice treat of course it goes without saying that the closer you are to populated areas uh, the more trashed any campsite is going to be no matter on what forest road and we tend to stay out in really unpopulated areas <clears throat> like this this trip coming through all different parts of remote Nevada and uh, now we're into Utah but still we tend to find the cleanest nicest places the more remote you can be the problem is like for example BLM land is really nice to camp on but you can't just go in anywhere you've got to have a road and sometimes those roads are pretty bad you're not going to tow a travel trailer onto them not very far so you're going to have to have some kind of pickup truck camper or some outfit like we've got with an overland or an overland style trailer something to get you in there and one thing to remember lots of times in national forest and BLM land there are cattle around and you got to remember that the rancher pays for those cattle to be there that's where part of the funding comes from to take care of those lands and the cattle you got to remember too are really good for the land they fertilize and they keep the grass cut and the grass comes back even more healthy. Remember, ranchers are in the business of raising grass. Anyways, uh, about the cattle, don't harass them. They paid to be there. <laughs> and sometimes <clears throat> when they see you around, they're gonna leave anyway. But in the wee hours of the morning, like around daybreak, they might come snooping around your outfit. Don't be panicked. <laughs> but more often than not, we end up with a pretty nice place to settle down for the night. And uh, sometimes we like to stay for a couple or three days. Just depends on how you feel, whether you're ready to move, whether we're ready to move on or not. Yeah. Let's hit it. 